I wonder what your greatest fear was growing up. I know for me um, and people my age, we lived during a strange time where uh, one of the greatest fears was nuclear war. And I don't know how many of you had to do this, but we had drills in school where we'd get under our desks and cover our heads. And I look back and I think, in a nuclear war, I'm not sure that would do a whole lot. <laughs> the one thing it did do is uh, it made us afraid. It, it caused us to fear. And I thought it was interesting, last December, our oldest granddaughter was having trouble sleeping and uh, our daughter uh, called us and said they figured it out because she had gone to uh, see Santa Claus with her sister and they told her all about Santa Claus and she was not comfortable with the idea of Santa Claus coming into their house when they were sleeping. <laughs> and so she was uh, told, well, we can make sure he delivers the presents on the porch and doesn't come in. But uh, we have all kinds of fears and I don't know if you have some fears now that uh, can be paralyzing, but I thought just for fun, I'd look up some of the strangest phobias. Um, one of them is nomophobia, which is fear of being without your mobile phone. Anybody have that fear? Another one is arithmophobia, which is a fear of numbers. Um, there's one that is so strange, it's called plutophobia, and that's a fear of money. Anybody have that fear, fear of money? Probably none of us do, right? Uh, how about uh, globophobia, a fear of balloons? This one is one, I don't know if I can even pronounce it, and it is really strange. It's omphalophobia. Omphilo, it's a fear of belly buttons. <laughs> and then maybe there's some people that you might know that have ergophobia, which is a fear of work. One is called decidophobia, which is just like it sounds, it's a fear of making decisions. And then phobophobia is a fear of phobias. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that can cause us fears today. Um, for some, maybe it's a, a fear of a financial disaster or fear of a, a loss of a spouse or family members or fear of of health issues or fears about your children or your grandchildren or crime or, or violence or conspiracies or loneliness or just a number of different kinds of fears can control us. And as we close out another school year, for, for many there's lots of changes coming up and changes can bring fear. Whether it's going to a new school or making new friends or living in a dorm far away from home or starting a new job, all of these things can be frightening experiences. And when we allow our fears to take root, we can experience anxiety. And there's a character in scripture whose example can teach us how to face and overcome our fears. So this morning I'd like for us to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 at David's situation. And this is a, a very familiar story. Uh, maybe you've never studied it in depth out of your Bible, but I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard the story uh, about David and Goliath. And so I just want to break it down and see if there are some principles that we can find in here for us and maybe some of the fears we face or some of the changes that are upcoming in our life. And the, the what is an intimidating situation, uh, the challenge of a giant. And we see that in the scripture passage from 1 Samuel 17, uh, verses 1 to 11. It says, The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Sokah in Judah and camped between Soko and Azekiah in Ephes Damin. Saul and the men of Israel gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, and then they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like that of a weaver's beam 
and the iron point of the spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, Why do you come out to line up in battle formation, he asked them. Am I not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we'll be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so that we can fight each other. When Saul and all Israel heard those words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. And then in verse 16, it says, Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. So you get a picture, a description of the scene, the situation. Um, talks about the battleground, and then it describes the champion of the Philistines. And I can't imagine being part of the Israelite army and hearing that challenge. And facing that giant uh, over nine feet tall. I don't know how many of you have um, faced physical giants, but when I was in seminary, I played intramural basketball, and it sure felt like that some of the guys that we played against were giants. And there was one team that had a, a player, and he was really more of a football player, but he was, I think, six foot nine. And uh, then there was another guy on his team that was six foot seven, and we just had a dorm team, you know, just a bunch of guys wanting to have fun. And I remember playing in that game, and um, there was one time when the six foot nine guy was dribbling down, going for a, a layup or a dunk, and I thought, I'll try to take a charge, and I just stood there. And I think I saw the bottom of his shoe <laughs> come up over my head as he dunked. And that's probably the closest I ever had in confronting a giant. But, you know, besides my pride and ego, it, it didn't cause too many problems. But this was a situation that was dire. I mean, this, this was about uh, freedom and enslavement by the enemy. And so he makes this challenge very confidently. And I'm sure the response was fear on the part of the Israelite armies. I think a principle for us is that facing our giants, though an intimidating experience, is required for growth and maturity. And so my question is, what intimidating giant is on your horizon? I think all of us have times in our life where we have those, whether it's a, a job change or, or maybe it's looking at retirement or going off to college. Uh, maybe for a parent it's letting go of a college-bound child. Uh, maybe it's a change in finances or a change in health or even a change in relationships. All of those things can feel like facing Goliath. But scripture makes it clear that our fears must be faced and not avoided. We can't avoid our, our giants. Uh, they seem to just grow uh, the longer we avoid them. And oftentimes they'll come back later if we don't face them. I remember when I was counseling in Cleveland, Ohio, I had a client that um, had a, a fear of flying. And so one of the common techniques in counseling related to uh, fears and anxieties is called systematic desensitization. And so what I, what I did with him as I met with him in counseling was to have him face his fear of flying by taking little steps. And it might be go to the airport and just watch the planes fly. Or it might be the second step would be um, take someone with you um, on a short flight. And then eventually it would be be able to take a flight on your own. I don't remember all the steps that, that it took, but with this particular client, it really seemed to work. That he was so terrified of flying, and then after several sessions and trying out some of these desensitization techniques, um, he was able to overcome some of his fears. And I remember he had a look of triumph on his face after I hadn't seen him for a while, and he came in for an appointment, and he said, you know what, I, I made a flight. I, I made a flight from Cleveland to Houston all by myself. 
and uh, it was a little bit scary, but I was able to overcome it. And you know, that's something that we need to realize is that we can't always avoid our fears. There are times when we need to face our fears. And the Israelites knew they had to confront this giant, but the question was, who was going to do it? Because you, you remember what I read and what the story was. Goliath didn't say, let's, let's uh, get our armies together and let's just have a clash. He said, no, you pick one guy and I will be our guy for the Philistines and we'll, we'll fight to the death. And so I don't know about you, but if I was there, I would probably be going like this. How about this guy? You know, it's not something that we would just readily go out there and do. And so we're going to look at the unlikely challengers, starting in verse 12. It says, now David was the son of the Ephrathite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons and during Saul's reign was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war, and their names were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, the next, and Shema, the third, and David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. So we, we, first of all, see a little bit about David's background. Um, he's the youngest. He really does not have the right credentials to be a soldier or, or to be a champion. And, and then in the next few verses, 17 to 19, we see what his assignment was. It says, one day Jesse had told his son David, take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Also take these ten portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the well-being of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. There with Saul and with all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And so basically his job was he was an errand boy. He was to take these supplies to them, check on how they're doing, and come back wasn't a real impressive job, but it was one maybe fitting for someone like David. And so he observes the scene when he gets there in verse 20. He got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. And while he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelites saw Goliath, they re retreated from him, terrified. So he, he goes out there, he, he's checking things out, and, and maybe he's already starting to, to think about what the possibilities were. Um, he observes the scene, and um, I'm sure he's wondering, how come there's no response? It said, previously an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for this man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You notice his confidence? He, he sees what's going on, but he has a zeal for God that shrinks the intimidation factor. He says, who is this that defies the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer and concluding, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and evil heart. You came down to see the battle. 
And so he's accusing David of uh, having bad motives for coming. Maybe not realizing that David's intent was to just fulfill his father's wishes. And so he, he criticizes him. And David's response is, what have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. When he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer, the people gave him the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul so that he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't fight the Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. So he goes to Saul, goes to the king, and uh, tells him uh, his perspective on things, but Saul has his doubts. David was just a, a teenage boy, didn't uh, uh, have any training. He, he wasn't schooled in using weapons of warfare, but he was confident in his God. And we see his confidence in God in verses 34 to 37. David answered, Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Wow. Can you imagine that? Just a kid had such confidence in God and knew that God had been faithful in his tending the sheep even when there was attacks of a lion or a bear. And so Saul tries to help him out and he um, has him try on his armor, but uh, the armor was way too big for him. And so it says in verse 49, instead he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling, in his hand, he approached the Philistine. You know, the principle here is that we need to have confidence in God, despite intimidating circumstances and faithless people. You know, there's always people, you can always find people who remind us we can't do it. You ever find people like that? You, get, you got people that say, well, this is why this isn't possible, or, or this is... Uh, why you're not the right person for the job. Or maybe you need to look elsewhere. Those people are all around. But they shouldn't intimidate us. They shouldn't keep us from doing what we believe is God's calling in our life. And we're setting ourselves up for spiritual failure when we rely on human resources instead of God. David wasn't going to use the armor that he wasn't trained in. He wasn't going to use those kind of weapons. He was going to use what God had equipped him with. In Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8, it says, This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength, and his heart turns from the Lord. He will be like a juniper in the Arabah. He will not see good when it comes. He dwells in the parched places of the wilderness in a salt land where no one lives. The person who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends its roots out toward a stream and doesn't fear when heat comes, and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. The point here is that the world constantly tells us we have to have the resources that are, are measurable by human standing, whether it's the right amount of money or the right scores on a on a test or whether it's uh, the right training and the whole message that's given today not just to our kids but to all of us is believe in yourself believe in yourself God says don't put confidence in yourself don't put confidence in human armies that's why so many of the stories in the Old Testament give us pictures of impossible situations where God comes through because he wants us to rely on him. He wants us to trust in him even in difficult circumstances. 
Someone once said, the proper perception for victory is never the size of the giant, but the size of our God. So as you're looking at the problems in your life or the giants that you're facing, are you overwhelmed by the size of the giant? Have you forgotten the size of our God? Big God, small problems. Small God, big problems. Sometimes it's easy for us to magnify our problem by reducing the size of our God. Um, sometimes I think we live like that old movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Do you remember that one? where they become real little and everything looks huge, whether it's an ant or whether it's a blade of grass or, or, or whatever. And that's how we live sometimes. We magnify our problems because we don't realize the size of our God. And thirdly, the how. Our victory is found through trusting in the Lord. Starting in, in verse 40. It says, instead, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones, put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came closer and closer to David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I'll strike, down, strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the earth will know that Israel has a God, and the whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. Notice what David does. He prepares for the battle in his own way by getting mere stones. And the trash talk begins. I don't know if this was the beginning of trash talk, but certainly that's what's going on here. I mean, Goliath is saying, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds and the beasts. And David responds, you've defied the God of Israel, and I'm going to chop off your head. I mean, man, that was quite an impressive uh, display of confidence. And then in 48, it kind of concludes by saying, when the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. To me, that's impressive. He was ready to go. I mean, he wasn't, uh-oh, I, I better be careful, kind of like boxers that for six rounds they're just kind of, you know, punching the air. He's, he's headed for the giant. And then it says, David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him. He grabbed the Philistine sword, pulled it from its sheath, and used it to kill him. Then he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. You know, the principle here is that spiritual victories are won through dynamic faith that puts into action what we claim to believe. You know, there's a whole chapter in the New Testament about heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm just going to read a, a little portion of that, Hebrews chapter 11, because it illustrates really clearly that it isn't just talking about faith, it's, it's putting faith into action that, that brings the victory. Um, it says in verse 4, by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts and even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. It says in verse 7, By faith Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen, and oh, motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. 
He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age. Um, by faith, in verse 17, Abraham, when tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, in verse 20, Isaac blessed Jacob. 23, by faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. Over and over again, we see the heroes of the faith have victory, overcome their fears. Why? It's because they don't just believe. They do something about it. They put it into action. There must be a, a proper balance between trust in God and a willingness to put our faith into action. See, God rarely works in a vacuum. Probably many of you have heard the story of the man who was stranded on his roof in a flood. And so he prayed to God to be rescued. And a guy in a rowboat came by and he said, jump in, I'll take you to safety. And he said, no, I'm, I'm trusting God. And so then a guy in a, in a motorboat comes by and he says, you know, you're going to be underwater soon. Um, jump in my boat and I'll take you to safety. And he said, no, I'm trusting God. And then finally a helicopter came and there was a, a man on a, a, a speaker that said, grab the rope and, I, and I'll take you to dry land. I'll, I'll rescue you. And the man said, no, I'm trusting God. Well, the man eventually drowned. And when he got to heaven, he was just wondering what what this was all about. And so he told God, what happened? I trusted you. And God said, I sent you a rowboat. I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a helicopter. What more did you want me to do? <laughs> Sometimes we can be like that. We can say, I'm trusting God. But God says, no, you step out. And you take a, a act of faith. You, you act on what you believe. And I guess that's the question for us today is, where do we need to put our faith into action. Ask God, what, what's the next step for me? God, I believe in you, but I don't know what to do. What, what do you want me to do to put my faith into action? You see, fear can paralyze us or can energize us. It all depends on how we respond to it. And living as a Christian means more than trusting God with our souls for eternity. It also means trusting him with our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So for our graduates, or for those that are facing some big change in their life, remember, God's going with you. He's right there. And for parents and grandparents, maybe that are fearful, release your kids and your grandkids to God and trust them to him. Let's bow our heads. Perhaps there's some application that God's Holy Spirit wants to impress upon your heart today. And the question is, will you respond? Will you respond to that prompting? Maybe for some it's putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's something you've never done. You've heard about it, been to church a lot, but you've never said, Lord, I, I'm going to trust you. I believe in you. I, I know you did die on the cross for my sins, and I receive you as my Savior today. Maybe that's the step you need to take. Or maybe it's you've kind of gotten comfortable relying on yourself, your own abilities, your own gifts, your own strength, and you realize that that's never going to bring the victory, that God's call to you is trust him. Don't trust in all the other resources you have. Trust him fully. And then... Maybe for most of us, it's taking that trust and putting it into action. Finding a way that we can show our trust in God by doing something. Whatever it might be, are you open to that? Will you ask God what he wants you to do? Father, I thank you for this time together in your word. We thank you for the example of David, an unlikely hero, and that the odds were against him, and yet he had victory because he trusted in you. And he put that, that faith into action. We pray that we would be able to do the same. In Jesus' name.
don't we all stand together and sing hymn number 41, God is so good. <clears throat> Please close this. 